see what happens. We're going to need to pan a little bit to the left, too. I don't think there's any point in going in that far. It doesn't show anything. No. Let's just go in to uh, <coughs> make sure you've got all of the buildings. <laughs> there goes the page. Careful of it is that it doesn't shake when I'm holding it. <laughs> you want the the uh, caption in there? Why don't you start with the caption and then go in where you just got a knife? shaking it a little bit. <laughs> I'll try to hold it steady. Do you want to focus on anyone in particular? No, that's just, that's enough. That's it. 
text find. It's pretty much just an identifier. on the Encyclopedia Britannica. Hmm. And you know when they wanted it? Saturday afternoon. Because all the farmers in the small towns came into their stores to look at television. Town, sure. And we put on the... <laughs> can you imagine? That was our programming premiere. Hmm. <clears throat> you were looking for... <clears throat> and Jack Shelley and Herb Planbeck and those fellows yeah. were in the news department there. Right. Then I was transferred back over here as sales manager. Mm -hmm. Of, the, of WSC television. Of television, yeah. right. And is that, you worked out your career then in that yeah, position? Yeah, right. Okay. Well, when did you start with WSC radio, just so I get the uh, little time perspective here, uh, approximately? I started, the World War II was still on. Okay. 1944. 44. Uh, I brought my bride here and we started with, in the radio. Okay. And you hadn't been in radio before then? Only in college. Okay. I broadcast... Uh, at Purdue for WBAA. Oh, okay. It stands for We Broadcast Almost Anything. <laughs> okay. So well, I was a sportscaster. That's what these guys do on our <laughs> stage, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I was a sportscaster uh, and, a, and a staff announcer. Well, you started in college radio. Yeah, then. yeah, just like a lot of people. Yeah. And, see, I was physically unable to do anything, so I knew I had to work with my mind uh -huh. to get a job. And fortunately, radio was my outlet. Yeah. 
if this was a godsend. Right. If it had come along a few years, if I'd have been born a hundred years earlier, I'd have been a beggar. I think. <laughs> well. But radio gave me the opportunity to raise a family and have a career. That's that's great. And I came out here and uh, we broadcast. In those days, there were only two radio stations in town. Yeah. WHBF, CBS. And WOC. WOC, NBC. Right. NBC had two networks. Remember the blue and the red? Oh, network? yes. Oh, then yes. they split the networks. Yeah. And finally, uh, we got an ABC station in town. Now there are 18 radio stations. Yeah, right. And somebody owns most yeah. of them, one guy. <laughs> well, we need to start here, don't we? You ready to go? Yeah. I'm taking our Then list. what let's do on this uh, staff is, is primarily stay in on a head and shoulders on Harold. And if you want to start, let, let me get a little bit, if you want to start out on it, so that, over and, the shoulders. and occasionally you may want to pull back to an over the shoulder. If I start talking too much, you pull back, okay, okay. and then hit me right behind the ear. Say, he's the interviewee. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yep, go ahead. Well, this is an Iowa Broadcasting History interview, which we're doing on the second day of December, 1998. We're at the home of Harold and George Ann Heath in Bettendorf, Iowa. And that's, of course, in the Quad Cities where uh, George Heath uh, lived much of his broadcasting career, uh, starting with uh, WOC Radio in, in uh, quite a few years back, Harold. 1944. 44. But before that, you, uh, you were one of these... Uh, College radio guys. Well, a lot of early radio men got their experience during college. I was at Purdue. Uh huh. Of our station, but just like WSUI or the other Iowa stations, cool. I got my feet wet and I liked radio and I decided I'd try to get into commercial radio. And you came out here then and got an announcing job? On, yes. On uh, the war was still going on. Maybe I was fortunate because the regular announcers had been drafted or volunteered. I was 4F. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I got a job as an announcer, and I spent quite a few years until television came along, and we decided uh, when the station was going to become a television outlet that we wanted to get into TV and into sales. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> what were? Uh, let's just talk a little bit about that early radio experience. It's not the very early experience, but it's it's very, it's contemporarily. My, my first radio experience was in '42 as a student. Well, so. So we came it's very parallel down the same path. Well, let me tell you how I got auditioned. This I'd, might be I'd love to hear it. Right. I went to Purdue, and they had an ad in the uh, paper, the college paper, for audition for announcers. And I thought, well, I wanted to do that anyway, so I went over, and I went through the typical announcers audition. They wanted to see if you had musical background, could pronounce the composer's names, read a little bit of news copy, and then they said, of all things. Now, recreate a basketball game and broadcast a okay. couple of minutes of basketball. Well, fortunately, I played basketball in high school, and I loved it. Uh -huh. So I just thought of my high school <laughs> team, and I started making up the darndest game that you can imagine. Mm. And when I was done, they said, you've passed. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, report Thursday afternoon to the Jefferson High School gym. We're going to broadcast the regional basketball tournament, <laughs> and we need you. <laughs> and that's how the whole thing started. And that was at <laughs> Purdue then? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well then, um, so you dis you decided to settle down, or at least to start your life together out here in the Quad Cities, is yes. that right? And you went down to WOC and applied to be on the air. Well, yes, and they hired me. Mm -hmm. And we came here, the war was still going on. Uh, the engineers at the station wore sidearms because of the Rock Island Arsenal. They mm -hmm. thought the Japanese were going to invade them, I guess. Mm -hmm. and I can still recall walking in the studio and seeing all the engineers carrying pistols around. I <laughs> didn't quite understand why, but they did. So what did you do, pull an announcer shift <laughs> then? Uh, that, yeah, right. just pull a regular announcer shift. Read the commercial, a lot of the commercials live. Some of them, yes. We had a good musical staff, mm -hmm. which later we used in television, mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So who would who would have been the manager of WOC at that time? Burl Lottridge was the original manager. Okay, and he's deceased now, of course. Um, Did you see B.J. Palmer around at that time? Yes, he was still alive. Mm -hmm. B.J. was uh, sometimes very evident. He would uh, show up to the studios at the most in inopportune times. <laughs> And have you ever read his book on announcing and copywriting? I've seen it. You've seen it. I've well, seen it. 
he was a stickler for pronunciation. Yes. Not pronounce it, pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And um, it was never temperature. It would drive him nuts if somebody said temperature. Uh -huh. You had to say temperature. Mm -hmm. And every station break had to be W-O-C, not W-O-C. Mm -hmm. uh, so BJ, if he caught an announcer slipping up, he, he was liable to come up himself and just eat him out. Just come down personally oh, yeah. and do it. <clears throat> and he'd lie on his in his home on a great big couch and listen to WHO during the night. Uh -huh. And if he didn't like what he heard over WHO, he'd call them on the telephone. <laughs> well, after all, it was his station. <laughs> yes, he owed it. And even his son, when Dave took over, mm -hmm. it was a very paternalistic place to work. Mm -hmm. Very, very much the Palmer operation. Yes, mm -hmm. and it was not like today's radio where it's so much bottom line and yeah. the bean counters have sort of changed the philosophy of a lot of stations. WMT is probably still the closest to old radio as you and I remember it now. The only one I know. They right. still have variety. Yeah. Most of them go on to very narrow casting yeah. and right. music that uh, appeals to a certain group. So uh, WOC was serving the community in those days, doing public service? Very much so. That was the philosophy that you and I grew up with. You bet. That mm -hmm. the broadcasters were part of the community. That you had to be involved in the civic activities. I got involved. I became president of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Did all the things that you did in your career. Yeah. Um, today, I'm not so sure that a lot of the broadcasters have that same feeling of civic responsibility. Well, you got to the fan them. you got to locate corporate headquarters yeah. <laughs> to start with, right. don't you? Well, let's <clears throat> that uh, we could talk a lot about your radio experience, but. One of the un very unique experiences you had personally, or along with your colleagues in that era, was to put Iowa's first television station on the air. That's true. That's true. And that must have been some experience. It was exciting. Uh, in those days, we were Channel <coughs> 6. We're currently Channel 5. You recall the station started signing on the air, and suddenly the FCC found out there was interference between right. markets, overlap, and they put a hold on, they put a freeze on. So we then had to become eventually Channel 5, which we've been ever since. But you signed on as Channel mm -hmm. 6. Signed on as Channel 6. And then you probably didn't get to 5 until after the freeze was lifted That's in 52. That's correct. <laughs> in 52 we were allocated. Mm -hmm. We signed on on uh, Halloween, October 31st, 1949. 49. And we were the biggest Halloween ghosts <laughs> in the whole area, I guess. <laughs> Those days, uh, you had to have at least five hours of programming per day. Mm -hmm. That was the FCC restriction. Now, most of those hours were made up of test patterns. We put on a big test pattern so all the small towns and the farmers could see them out in there and, and the dealers could sell their television sets. Some people thought there wasn't anything but test pattern. Well, they, they ran a long time. <laughs> and we had a crawl. Yeah. Our news consisted of a, a crawl across the bottom, remember? Mm -hmm. And they'd give the highlights of the news by the crawl. Mm -hmm. So where, where, did, where, where did you go on the air physically? Physically, we were in the same location that the station's in today. Still right down here on Brady Street right. then. Mm -hmm. It was in an old mansion. Mm -hmm they converted the living room of that mansion into a studio. Mm -hmm. And they nested the sets behind each other, much as you would on a stage. Mm -hmm. And we, there were no commercials. Nobody mm -hmm. bought commercials. They didn't. But we ran Smokey Bear mm -hmm. and some public service things. And while they were running, the stage crew came in and whipped that set off, piled it against the wall on the other side, and there behind it nested was the set for the next show. Mm -hmm. Now, we had to originate <coughs> all of our own shows. Everything, Everything came out of no network. There was no network. Was no network. It wasn't until several years later that the network came. Right. We originated live musical shows. We originated a weather forecast with a puppet called mm. Mr. Weatherwise. Uh, I had a program called Sport Trades, which was a sports show. Uh -huh. I did interviews on sports. And interestingly enough, Grant, one of our first programs involved the broadcast of the Oregon-Iowa football game. It was done by Forrest Evashevsky. The Oregon-Iowa football game. Yes. Now, it was not done live. 
But you, you, in those days, Evy had just come to Iowa. Uh -huh. He was so interested in getting promotion, publicity, out about his program, and to get recruits in the Quad City area. That man would take the film highlights that the coaches made, edit them, bring them up here, drive them personally to Davenport, put them on the air, narrate them, all for $75 a week. Okay, so he, he used the, the game films and edited them into a, into a recreate, well, a, a re about four, delayed broadcast. Probably 20, 25 minutes. 20, 25 but minutes. But he narrated himself. Uh -huh. And his, his fee was $75 a week. Boy, that's a story that I'd never heard before. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Well, our first actual program was Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. And Kukla, Fran, and Ollie had started a couple years earlier in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And we carried it on Monday when we signed on, Halloween Day. It was a kinescope. And the older broadcasters know that kinescope was just the film was taken the right film off the taken face off, of the tube. Off the, off the face of the yeah, tube. Yeah, they developed the film instead. And it was grainy. It was raw. Very poor quality. And they shipped that out to you on the yes. bus or on the train? or it came <coughs> by bus usually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had mostly movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said, we sold the Encyclopedia Britannica because the dealers in the small towns wanted to sell television sets. And our, one of our first sales was to put it on a Saturday afternoon where every farmer could come in and buy a television set and see the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm -hmm. That's a motion. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought some movies. We got the Philco Playhouse out of New York. Okay. That was on Friday night. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was really all local. Well, you... <coughs> You've handed me the uh, just a typewritten sheet with the first day's programming, October 31, 49, ran test pattern from 9:15 a.m. to uh, <coughs> three, well, to 6 p.m. <coughs> right. And at 6 p.m., Kukla, Fran, and Ollie, <coughs> Fran Allison, in in television, the, who came out of the WMT experience yep. at uh, at Wood Fran was a Cedar Rapids gal who went to Chicago and got famous on Kukla, Fran, and Ollie was on the Breakfast Club <coughs> right. radio first. Right. <coughs> well, then at the next one, at 6.30, we saw sightseeing at home. What was that? Uh, what we did, and the, you understand we had no films. We did have some still photographs. Mm -hmm. And we, we tried to get advertisers and clients, and we'd go around the Quad Cities and take pictures of certain areas, develop the still shots. And sometimes we'd go into the store and take pictures and then invite the owner to come up and be on television. They didn't want to advertise, but when their friends began to say, hey, I saw you on television, okay. then they realized that people did watch. When we signed on the air, there were 400 sets. 400 sets. 400, that's it. That's not much of a universe, is it? <laughs> you, you wouldn't you want got to, that many in one block here. <laughs> you wouldn't want it to be trying to make a commission off that no. potential, would you? <clears throat> Well, then they uh, then you did a uh, at six forty five you did a, an NBC salute to WOC TV that came out of Kinescope came out on Kinescope out of New York. Mm -hmm. and then the movie ran uh, seven to eight home movie theater waterfront lady I bet that was a winner <laughs> I I don't recall <laughs> I'm sure you don't it probably was not memorable <laughs> well and so it went uh, then Tuesday uh, you were Again, it was uh, Cook the Fran and Ollie test pattern, 9.15 to uh, 6, and Cook the Fran and Ollie, Iowa Land of Opportunity. You remember that one? No. <laughs> uh, not, not <laughs> and the feature film. <clears throat> and people were going nuts over this, weren't they? Yeah, it was interesting, and it was exciting to the staff. That's yeah. what I like to mention, because we were all still working at our radio jobs, and that schedule indicates we were on the air only at night. Mm -hmm. None of us got paid. We all went down there because we wanted the experience. Mm -hmm. It was exciting. It was new. We were pioneers. And uh, it wasn't till several years later that anyone was paid to work for the television station because it couldn't make any money. Uh -huh. It was being sustained by WOC and WHO. The, the revenue from the radio stations were paying for the television. We had remote trucks believe it or not, BJ bought two big vans and trucks and outfitted them, one for WHO, one for WOC. They were monsters. 
but we did remotes from the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds. We did remotes from Wharton Fieldhouse and Moline of high school mm -hmm. basketball. We broadcast remotes from the high school football team in uh, Davenport. We went to the home and food show, anywhere we could do. Well, how did people. you get them in? Did, did you, how, do, what, how, did you, how did you connect them to the, to the studio? They had line of sight, one dish that the engineers put. So it was a microwave. It system. was a microwave. Okay. They had to go up. There was nothing automatic. Every time we did a remote, they had to climb up the tower and adjust the dish up above, the microwave dish, to we got was the exact zero, point. Right? It had to be zero, mm -hmm. or they couldn't pick up the signal. So it was a microwave yes. uh, technology that was being used. And that was long before tape machines of mm -hmm. everything. Everything was live. We used to have people come back from Arizona or Florida and say, gosh, you put on better shows here than we see there. That made us feel good. Well, that was <clears throat> that would have been very, very unique for a, a station in a town the size of, or, or area the size of the Quad Cities to have a remote truck. Well, it was primarily, I think, because of WHO and the 50,000 watts over there. Uh -huh. They did the same thing in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, it was far-sighted, it was unique. Uh, it was far preceding anything that uh, is done now with these little remote trucks that the stations run around with. Right. They're mobile. They can go about anywhere. We were restricted to line of sight. Uh, sometimes, in, uh, in fact... You were shooting to a receiving dish on the right, building. Right, and sometimes, in <coughs> fact, we had <coughs> trouble getting a signal out of a certain place. I'm sure. The engineers had to go out and run <coughs> a field test mm -hmm. to be certain they could get the signal out. And every time a man had to climb up that tower, no matter <laughs> what the weather, and zero in on the signal. And the tower was on the truck then, right? Well, uh, the tower I'm speaking about was at the studio. Oh, at the studio. There was a smaller one on the truck. Okay. Yeah. In other words, the, they adjusted the, the, the dish on the, at the studio to, uh, to establish to the, the path. truck. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, I'm sure that, did he get paid for doing that? <laughs> I don't know, but in the winter it was precarious. <clears throat> um, we put on a lot of shows uh, on reflection. We had a cooking show, as a lot of stations did in yeah. those days, with the Home Economist. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a hunting and fishing show uh, with a couple guys. Uh, we just we tried about everything we could, mm -hmm. and um, it evolved gradually. Three years later, we joined the network. They built a series of microwave towers about. 30 miles apart. Mm -hmm. Remember when they came across oh, by yes. us? Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, that had to be line of sight. There mm -hmm. were no satellites or no right. coax. So those towers were every 30 miles. They built, AT&T built towers to relay the television. To relay the television. So, <clears throat> so by the time you got to, uh, what, what do you remember when you got live network approximately? It would have been 50s. Uh, I would say probably in 49. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, um, but <clears throat> I don't recall exactly. Mm -hmm. But you were, uh, you were operating, um, for at least two years we were independent. We're strictly dependent on, on kinescopes and, and local origination. Mostly local origination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It grew, for, we, as, mm. uh, just a few hours a day into full time every night. And it wasn't until much later that we were able to program during the day. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you remember when the station started attempting doing some news other than the the crawl that you mentioned? Well, uh, it was not too long after that because uh, B.J. was a stickler for being first. Mm -hmm. He was very proud that he was one of the first stations west of the Mississippi. Yeah, you recall that's why the call letters were grandfathered in as WOC, uh -huh. the FCC that said everything west of the Mississippi has to be a K. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, it didn't work out that way. The older stations were finally grandfathered in. But he wanted to be first with everything. We had the first color cameras in the Quad Cities. I don't know that they were first in Iowa. I can't attest to mm -hmm. that. But um, he wanted to be first. So the first newscast probably occurred live uh, about uh, two months after we went on the air. Mm -hmm. So fairly early yes, in the experience. Very early. Do you remember who was doing it? <clears throat> uh, Bob Frank. Okay. Bob still lives in Bettendorf. Okay. He's in, his health is rather precarious. 
And uh, I think Bob Redeen was another uh, on-air man. Mm -hmm. He later went with the Voice of America. Mm -hmm. Six o'clock news? Mm. Uh, mostly 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, yeah. Most of it, the early most ones of them were came 10. Late, yeah. right. mm -hmm. The six o'clock was a later was a later, later development. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it, you needed that extra time because if you shot any film footage, as they began to get your own film process, <laughs> yes. in the process film, quality of which was sometimes debatable, Very particularly debatable. after <laughs> color came. Yeah. You know, uh, it, they required that time to edit the film mm -hmm. and get ready. So there's only one newscast. Mm -hmm. That was usually at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> so you were, you were paid to be a radio announcer, but you came down and did some television duty to get the experience. We did anything we could do. Yeah. I mean, almost anything. Yeah. Uh, the, everybody on the staff volunteered to move cameras. They volunteered to set up lights. They just, you know, I was a gopher, I guess. I didn't do much. I was, went around and got things for people. But um, but you had an on-air show, and then you did the sports show. Oh, yes, I did the sports show. One of the first uh, interviews I ever did was with Leon Hart, who was an All-American at Notre Dame. Uh -huh. I remember how thrilled I was that he was on my sports mm -hmm. show. What, how, was that a, was it a standalone show or was it? was standalone. It was like oh. one of these that was nested behind the set. Uh -huh. I had a regular sports set and uh, we had, a, see in those days, we had a staff artist. Mm -hmm. uh, every SIG on the station, every commercial announcement almost had to have a handwritten Hardcore. local, every station had an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way my sports show went. I had no film. I didn't shoot film. Mm -hmm. Most of it was done just live interviews. Live like interview. you and I are talking right, right now. Right. Sat down and talked right. with maybe one or two. Or right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that again, that was <clears throat> that one of the things that <clears throat> one of the interviews that we did um, last summer, I guess it was, was with Edna Herb stuff at uh, KCRG, <clears throat> and uh, one of the comments that she made is. <clears throat> When they were getting ready to go on the air, they used to drive down to Davenport so they could watch WOC to figure out how you do television. <clears throat> I don't, well, we used to try to watch Chicago. And she mentioned on that too. On certain nights you could yeah. get Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I can recall watching Chicago television saying, gee, another few months and we'll be doing that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I imagine some pretty interesting things happened in that studio with that um, everything live. Very unusual. Things. Two cameras. <clears throat> Most things had two cameras. Uh, some unusual circumstances. You remember the uh, code said that you could not drink beer on the air. Oh yes. <laughs> but you could bring it up to your lips and pretend you were getting ready to drink it then the camera had to go dark. Uh -huh. We had one occasion where we were out in the studio in the back garage, which had been converted to a studio in the summertime, and there were flies around, they were trying to sell beer. <laughs> and it was, it was an exercise of futility in a way. But the announcer wanted to tell how that wonderful Black Hawk beer was. He brought it up, and the director didn't get the camera off in time. <laughs> it caught him throwing it into a bucket, saying, Ish! <laughs> <laughs> so the client didn't like that. No, I suppose that was not. <laughs> Total, fully planned, was it? <laughs> yeah, but they did some some things which uh, I don't know how public this thing will become, but uh, we sent an announcer to Chicago to come back and do wrestling from the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. We were doing a live show. But we sent him in to get experience. He found out in Chicago they'd take a stalk of celery and break it <laughs> right near the microphone to sound like the bones breaking. Right <laughs> so he came back and he came up with a wonderful thing. Had women's wrestling. And he said, oh, beautiful for spacious thighs, for ample raised with groin. <laughs> <laughs> People didn't like that. In those days, that was pretty risque. That would <laughs> kind of get their attention, all right. <laughs> and then, and I can recall that the, some of the tricks they played on the announcer uh, out at the fairgrounds. He was rather pompous in his attitude. And he was one of these fellows who always developed a very stern delivery. He was supposed to do a delivery for a new refrigerator that had a, a uh, can opener in the door. Well, the rehearsal went very fine, but 
during the show, and it had to be live, everything was live, you couldn't redo it, the prop crew substituted a hot bottle of beer in the middle of summer, and he opened it, and it just spewed all over it. It's just, <laughs> they thought it was funny. Yeah. Once again, the client and the station manager didn't. And those things disappeared from the we had, industry. Oh, we, right. Some priceless things yeah. happened. Yeah. When it, everything had to be live. Sure. No right. retakes, yeah. no redos, no editing. And what you got was you saw whatever happened. Yes, that was it. <laughs> Unless the director could move quicker than, than he did with the guy <laughs> with the Black Hawk beer. <clears throat> Harold, uh, <clears throat> you, uh, you decided uh, to take your career in the direction of sales. It was an economic necessity for me. Not surprised. That uh, I suddenly found myself with two children in a small market. I had a physical situation that I knew would not allow me to be an announcer in the big time. You must recall once again that everything in those days was done live, and a lot of it was a product demonstration. Sure, on camera. Announcer would get on camera and demonstrate something, and I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. So I went to the manager and said, I, uh, I enjoy the on-air work, but I really think for the, my long-range career it should be in something in sales. And they gave me a chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, about uh, six months after we signed on the air, he came to me one day. I was still out trying to sell and trying to be air announcer, run an announcership. He said, you've got to make up your mind. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Well, I looked at the future and my future, and I said, I prefer to be in sales. Mm -hmm. So I dropped the dulcet tones, <laughs> got out of the radio. Well, you still room. have them. but <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, felt that my economic future for myself and my family would lie on the business side. So you, you developed your sales career at WOC, yes. and then... You made, a, you made a trip over to Des Moines and spent some time over there. I was in Des Moines market for five years. KRNT was getting ready to sign on the air, uh -huh. and they needed salesmen. They advertised. Mm -hmm. I applied, and fortunately I got I enjoyed my time at KRNT. Uh, the, the manager was Bob Dillon. You mm -hmm. may remember that name. One of the great names. Fine, great name. In fact, yeah. Bob started here at WOC Did he? I many years that. ago as a mm -hmm. salesman. Mm -hmm. But he was managing KRNT at the time. Mm -hmm. And his philosophy was the sales department should sell both radio and television. Uh -huh. He wanted his salesman to, in effect, act as almost an advertising agency. Yeah. He didn't want the newspaper to get the money. He didn't want us fighting over it. He said, you go out, you control the budget. If you can do a better job for him on television, sell him television. Do a better job on radio, sell him radio. So for five, oh well, three and a half years, mm -hmm. I sold both for mm -hmm. KRNT. Mm -hmm. And then BJ died, and uh, Dave Palmer called me and said, we would like for you to come back to the uh, Palmer organization. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm flattered. What, what do you want me to do? Well, we want you to go to WHO. Now, Dave had just in effect, taken over as the owner of the station mm -hmm. upon his father's death. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if some of the people at WHO maybe thought I was Dave's spy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, Dave put me over there as the assistant manager. I see. And then a very unfortunate thing happened to Paul Loyette. You remember Paul? Well, I know that name. He was one of the great... Well, Loyette was one of the great uh, managers. He was an engineer. Engineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he developed cancer of the laryngitis, and he had mm -hmm. a laryngectomy. Mm -hmm. And so for about uh, four or five months, he couldn't communicate very well. Mm -hmm. So suddenly, I'm just a young salesman off the competitor, and I find myself running WHO radio and television, mm -hmm. which was exhilarating, but also a little frightening, yeah. because I didn't have the experience I should have had to step into that job. Um, I'd had about uh, maybe six months under Loyette as mm -hmm. assistant manager, but I certainly wasn't qualified to run that big operation. <coughs> so um, Loyette then got a um, esophageal speaking voice, if you've mm -hmm. heard those, mm -hmm. and he began to learn how to type. Uh, I mean, he, uh, type, I was thinking he used to get on the frog and he talked to his engineering friends around the country in Morse code. Uh -huh. But he couldn't do that with me. Sure. So uh, as he got regained his health, Dave said, I want you to come back to Davenport. We need you over here as sales manager. Mm -hmm. 
So it's that we, I brought my family back to Davenport, and I stayed there ever since. And you, so you, that was the, you filled out your career as a sales right. manager of WOC uh, right. Television then. So, and you were the guys who were out there uh, making that engine run. <coughs> well, one of the things we did, and I am very proud of this, uh, I have here a basketball autographed by the Iowa basketball team mm -hmm. and Lute Olson the year they went to the Final Four. The fabulous few. <coughs> fabulous few. Um, we were in a situation where KWWL and Sioux City were both owned by the same people. Mm -hmm. Blackhawk. Blackhawk, and they were both NBC. Yeah. WHO and WOC here were owned by Palmer yeah. and NBC. Mm -hmm. So we had the four NBC stations, and we got our heads together and we bid for and got the Iowa basketball games. That was the first telecast on a regular basis of Iowa basketball. Right. That went for probably five or six years. We had a good thing going. The people of Iowa loved, loved it. it. Mm. It was great. And I was very proud to be part of putting that network together. Yeah, with, with you and Bolster and right. the other folks. Bill that, Bolster, yeah. 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 And uh, I met some awfully nice fellows through the IB. Don Sullivan out at, uh, at uh, Sioux City and Bill Corton at WMT and Lou Van Ostrin. I consider them all acquaintances and friends. Um, I got involved in the Iowa Broadcasters Association. I enjoyed it very, very much. And you headed that and organization? One year I was proud to be their president. Mm -hmm. And I did some things there which I'd like to relate to you. Yes. Uh, take some credit for, I had proposed a good sportsmanship award. Uh -huh. And it is documented in my letters, which you're welcome to read, mm -hmm. to Bernie Sagaw, the Iowa High School Athletic Association. And I wanted the broadcasters to sponsor that good sportsmanship award. Uh -huh. I had conceived it originally as being given to a player, one individual. Mm -hmm. Because frequently in a tournament like that, there is an outstanding player who shows great sportsmanship. Right. And I thought it would be an honor. Well, the IBA board batted around. Bernie Saigo took it to his board. They batted around. What evolved was the sportsmanship trophy that is now awarded every year and which the high schools in the state value very, very much. At the state basketball tournament. At the state basketball tournament. tournament. Okay. They award, remember, every year they mm. get a, one school is picked out for the best sportsmanship. Right. They take their cheerleaders and their team and everything into account. And you were the originator of that well, concept. Well, I wasn't. The only I was originating no. the concept. Right. It was carried out by the Iowa Broadcasters Well, that is something to be proud of. And the current IBA logo was designed huh. by my agency here in uh, Davenport. Mm -hmm. It cost us $75. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was worth the money, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <clears throat> well, speaking of that, uh, Harold, uh, you mentioned that you were running test patterns so the dealers could sell televisions yeah. and there were 400 sets when in the Quad Cities when WOC went on the air in 1949. Yeah. The, and the radio had to pay <clears throat> because television couldn't make any money. That changed a little, didn't it? Yeah, it took years though. Yeah. Uh, in those days, uh, I, I still have the first rate cards the station ever had because I was in sales, I saved them. Yeah among part of the junk I moved over here. I threw a lot of, way of my memorabilia away because we had to downsize from a big old house into a, a apartment. Building. I should have got here a little sooner. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I did throw away some things mm -hmm. that I felt had served their purpose. Sure. I wish I had them now, but you're welcome to what I do have in the way of memorabilia. Recall what, what that <clears throat> maybe a, a because they were mostly minutes then. You weren't doing many. They only 30s. had, they only had um, minutes, or they had 10 seconds on the rate card. Uh -huh. But most of the minutes we started with would cost $50. $50. That was in prime time. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, all we had was prime time yeah. at mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I guess the point that you, you were witness to, participant in, uh, <clears throat> just a fabulously successful uh, business once it really locked in yes. to what it became. And Produced huge amounts of money. It just, it blossomed. 
it was uh, in those days the fifty dollar commercial had to be live. Mm -hmm. Most of it had to be demonstration of product or just showing product. Sure. But you think what they have now in the way of film and tape and uh, satellite delivery of things. Uh, you know that it we're just on the threshold of another revolution with this computer. Of course. Uh, it's amazing. The the first uh, computer I think had uh, a couple million tubes in it. Mm -hmm. And the old television studios, when we first started walking, had, uh, working, had vacuum tubes. Oh, yes. Yeah, now right. they've torn those all out and they got a little uh, Pentel transistor that you can take a laptop computer and do exactly what the whole station could do at those days. Exactly, right. And I, I watched them evolve through two-inch tapes, the big old Ampex yep. machines. quads. Mm. And uh, I had at one time a lot of programs saved on quads, but then I couldn't find anybody to convert them, so I threw them away. <laughs> As I said, we, we should have gotten here sooner, but uh, we're, we're glad we're here today anyway. But it's, uh, it's been a good life for Harold oh. and George Ann in this business. Yes, I've been very fortunate to have an understanding wife. I've had <laughs> good children. I feel very fortunate. And again, as you you mentioned, some just some just great names in Iowa Broadcasting, Corton and Sullivan and Dillon and and uh, well and Harder. Yeah. There are, there are uh, fond memories of all those men in my mind. Yeah. And um, they were my mentors, my associates. And uh, I felt helped me along the way. Yeah. I I, um, I re took an early retirement, and I, I kind of regretted it, but yet I don't. Um, the station came along with one of these early retirement things, mm -hmm. and uh, they were forced by law to offer it to every employee. Mm -hmm. They couldn't be selective. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it and thought of the pressure that I was under. Some of it self-imposed, but I'd had one heart attack and I had a quadruple bypass, one of the early ones in this area, yeah. and I decided it wasn't worth it. If I was going to stay alive, Absolutely. I would take early retirement. Let's face it, Harold, things have changed an awful lot since those 40 oh, days yes. when we started, and they're not all for the better, <laughs> but it's it's been quite a ride. Well, it's been interesting for me to let you to let me review that. and. Well, it's been uh, great. A lot of things I could think about if you want to come back tomorrow. <laughs> well, we'll, well, maybe we'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Grant. Really Good appreciate. to see you again. Yes, indeed. Well, we could spend the rest of the afternoon here, but I guess we don't have time to do that. Well.